The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you On the talk station, Faith Matters. And welcome to Faith Matters for another week here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm joined today with Bishop Doc Loomis. And Bishop, we're all alone today. We, we are. Well, <laughs> neither one of us are alone, but we are missing Robert. We're missing Robert now. Yes. And Mark is long since gone. So, <laughs> Who? <laughs> oh, that other guy. The other guy. Sit over yeah. there. Yeah, so uh, we have a number of topics we want to talk about here today, including uh, what what is a momentous decision uh, been called the maybe the perhaps the the most influential decision by the Supreme Court since Roe v. Wade, and it is about um, abortion and about abortion clinics, and it is the the dissent of of, um, of the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling that the Texas law that required um, basic certain kinds of um, surgical proceeding, uh, proceedings uh, or availability of that, uh, certain criteria of, the, of uh, abortion clinics, is was struck down. Uh, let me read from the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal um, about SCOTUS abortion rights highlights the majority and dissenting opinions. And then we'll also read another article from uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom about women's health and safety at risk after Supreme Court rules against Texas law. So from the Wall Street Journal first, the Supreme Court on Monday struck down a Texas law regulating the state's abortion clinics, concluding the rules were an undue burden on a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. The justices voting 5-3 to three struck down a Texas law signed by then-Governor Rick Perry in 2013 that requires abortion clinics to meet the standards of ambulatory surgical centers and mandates that the physicians performing the procedure maintain admitting pr- privileges at a hospital within 30 miles. Now, there were other provisions to that law as well, but the entire law was struck down, and that's part of the object of uh, talking about this as well. Uh, the article that was from the Alliance Defending Freedom uh, and uh, they are pro-life group says that for the first time in nearly a decade, the Supreme Court agreed to hear a case about abortion, specifically Texas House Bill 2. Uh, ironically, that's HB2, isn't mm-hmm. it? And, uh, and this no-brainer law uh, requires abortionists and abortion facilities to comply with the same health and safety standards as similar outpatient surgical centers. These standards include having hallways wide enough for a gurney, adequate staffing, and proper sterilization procedures. The law also requires that abolitionists have uh, that uh, that abortionists have admitting privileges to a hospital within 30 miles of the abortion facility in case a woman needs immediate medical attention from post-abortion complications. Uh, this is a major case and is of great concern to people who are who want to value the life of the unborn. And so, Bishop, it, it's a this is a tough ruling. It's a tough ruling, and the, I think one of the first things we need to get out of the way is I listened to. Uh, the news this morning before we came in, and there were people talking about Anton Scalia's untimely death, and that had he been on the court, things would have been different. But this was a five to three ruling, mm-hmm. the dissenters being the three. And, well, I, uh, I spoke with actually somebody from Red Alert Politics yesterday, one of the commentators, and said that uh, you know, but his voice though could have been heard, and it may have you know maybe Anton, uh, uh, maybe Anthony Kennedy would have been persuaded. It, it is possible. That, that's true. But mm-hmm. the reality is it's a five to three. So in two, 2013, the governor uh, gets behind a law that gets passed in Texas, House Bill 2, and it is uh, it lists all the things that you just said, all those mm-hmm. requirements. And, you know, I don't think there's any doubt. If you remember when that was passed, there was a lot of conversation about the fact that the governor just didn't like and 
for that matter, the House did not like the idea of abortion. They were mm-hmm. not abortion activists. Right. And so they were trying to find a way to limit abortions, which, in my mind, is an extremely godly thing to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to do godly things in an ungodly society, though. Yes. So they tried to do this, and what happened was that uh, they, they simply set up the same standards for abortion clinics that they would have set up for any dock-in-the-box or ambulatory care clinic in, in the state. Mm-hmm. And so when the author calls it a no-brainer, it is kind of a no-brainer. You would think that the state would have a vested interest in the health and welfare, the safety of the patients at whatever medical facility they're, you know, they're attending to. Well, was, and over that time, there are about 40 clinics in the state of Texas, and uh, – and any number of the, I think about half of them closed or discontinued providing that particular service, that being abortion. And so one of the clinics decided to sue, and mm-hmm. of course this case got to the uh, got to the Supreme Court. Well, you touch on part there that becomes a touchstone in this case, and really a turning point in this case is the data. Uh, the majority opinion relied a lot on the data that was produced and which the uh, minority opinion says is faulty to begin with. Is It has its problems and because you can't say that all of these clinics closed precisely for those reasons and, and not for other reasons. So. Right, and, and more to the point that they, they didn't discern for exactly which of those reasons. Mm-hmm. Did they close because they had to have... Uh, fire alarms and extinguishers did they close because they had a hallway large enough for a gantry to go down gurney yeah did or did they did they close because they uh uh, the doctors had to have admitting privileges within 30 miles Mm -hmm. did they close because of health inspections it's hard to know which reason Mm -hmm. a clinic did they close for lack of business Right. We have seen abortion rates actually going down. It, as has so, Texas. So significantly. Yeah. And so a part of the issue is And we've had it we had a clinic close in Jacksonville. Well just, that's right. Just that's recently, not been that long ago. Without these kinds of restrictions. And so the question was it's a question of severability. Did the court uh the court has the authority to look at a case like this and say, Well, okay, we're gonna strike everything down. Or we're going to take pieces and parts and say that they don't uh, match up with the Constitution. Uh, they they unduly inhibit the right of a woman to uh, attend to her abortion. Mm-hmm. And what the court could have done and didn't, and it's actually a little bit surprising, is they didn't leave in place the things that weren't that controversial. Right. Well, which led uh, which led the uh, one of the descending opinions to say that well this points to this being an agenda driven decision, not a decision based on law, but a decision based on the predetermined desire. Yeah, but I want to be let, but let's be fair and call you know an apple an apple. I mean, it was a it was a a morally politically motivated group that that passed hb2 in the first place so we should sure. expect yeah. that politics is going to run into itself at some point as it goes down the road and so now we have the the, the frightening thing is for us as christians is that that we believe that the motivation whatever it was of the house in texas and of the governor was a was a good godly moral Decision. I mean, that's yes. they were making a good choice to do something that they knew me, would bless me, the Lord. But let me make a let me make an analogy, a biblical analogy here, and you please. can help me out because you're you're much more versed. I own, in I own a Bible. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, is that is that when uh, when the the people uh, went to uh, their leaders in in the Old Testament and said, "Well, you know, we want a king," and uh, but God did not want them to have a king, uh, but He said, "Okay." Uh, we'll relent. You can have it in this way. Or we want to have a divorce, and said no. You're not supposed to do that. But if you do, it will be done in this procedure. The, the Texas legislature said we don't want abortion at all. But if you're going to do it, then it needs to be done in this way that provides certain protections. Is that analogy off base? I think it's wonderful. I'm surprised the writer didn't put it in the articles today. <laughs> that we read three different articles about this. Mm-hmm. 
And the thing that strikes me in all of them is the um, the remarkable and overreaching authority that is given to our Supreme Court to override these kinds of things that happen at, at state levels. Now, I understand that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's why we have these levels of jurisprudence. But it is really frightening when a Supreme Court can simply say, no, not so much to that. Right. And to see that uh, and to see that the damage that's been done to the Supreme Court over the last 50 years in the uh, in the way that the liberal justices have built up to a point where there can be five five people voting mm -hmm. against the safety of. Yes. Women. Right. It's right. Just, it's amazing to me. You know, it does make me want to now when I go and visit a doctor's office, I'm going to look and see are these are these hallways wide enough for a gurney? Because I may make a choice. I may make a decision now not to go there yeah. if it's not. So because of what should I'm not the spring chicken anymore. What should if something should happen? I'd want to know that I can get the right care. So uh, this seems to be a perfectly reasonable uh, requirement to make. However, uh, but, however, but this is again. This again. is if Robert were here, he would say this is about the money. Yes, this is a follow the money situation, mm -hmm. and this court case came up because one particular uh, uh, clinic group in Texas uh, was losing money, was closing, and they had they were they were losing the money that abortionists make. It's amazing to me. So, th th so they called it an undue hardship. I think is the way the court mm -hmm. language works. It was undue hardship to women. Well, what it was was an undue hardship to abortionists who were losing money, and they brought this and they brought this thing up. And to, for our, for a Supreme Court of the United States, I mean, if you've been to the Supreme Court, you know what it looks like. You know mm -hmm. that you know once upon a time, Ten Commandments stood there, and it's an amazing thing that they would turn against uh, a moral. A, a I want moral to come back to this a little bit because there was a case uh, that they uh, that was pointed to by both the um, by the uh, majority and the minority opinion. A uh, case out of Pennsylvania that actually um, kind of muddied the waters in this whole decision. We'll talk about that coming up in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Bishop Doc Loomis. And we're uh, talking about, uh, in our first segment, I'm going to continue a little bit more here uh, on this uh, subject of the Supreme Court's decision to strike down the Texas law that put restrictions on abortion clinics or requirements of abortion clinics to be like surgical centers, to be like, <laughs> be like doctors. Imagine that. Uh, but uh, I want to go to uh, this article in the Wall Street Journal again because it also outlines the majority and the, and the minority opinions, the dissenting opinions. Uh, Justice Alito, uh, writing for the dissenters, says at least nine Texas clinics may have ceased performing abortions or reduced capacity for one or more reasons that have nothing to do with the provisions challenged here. You mentioned that before. Also, petitioners <clears throat> offered a scant evidence on the capacity of the clinics that are uh, able to comply with admitting privileges and ASC requirements. Again, the, um, uh, it is the, uh, the, the data that was driving the minority, majority opinion that they challenge. But then um, there's also the part here about um, the the clinic in Pennsylvania uh, that is it Kermit is that his first name Gosnell Kermit Gosnell scandal there too where where it was an it was an abomination the clinic was dirty nothing was sterilized the the place was just horribly equipped um, and the botched uh, abortions were occurring on a regular basis and the practitioners were not were not medical professionals in right. many cases. Yeah. Yeah. And so there, there was no effort to try and do anything except for make as much money as possible. And, and he was, he was arrested. I would think, right. I mean, he's, I think he's been found guilty already. So, uh, first degree murder and yeah, manslaughter. Right. So this is a, this is, this is such an exception to me that it, I think it, it gummed up the works to even be mentioned in this case because it was beyond the pale and he was going to be, he was going to be the criminal no matter what restrictions had been in place. So, uh, however, it does highlight the need to make sure. Well, wait a minute. Do we have any? Do we have any Gosnells that are that are possibly in the works here? 
uh, not because they're trying to make as much money as they want to make or they have a criminal mindset, but because they don't meet certain standards. So that was probably the only relevant way, but I thought it was kind of a messy way to do it. Well, it, it was it, the case was it, that case was such a that was so it was really a unique situation, wasn't it? And so to use that as as a well, this is why. But the reality is, if you look at the numbers, I mean, twenty six thousand five. The last year we have numbers for mm-hmm. over twenty six thousand women had complications following their abortions. And of those, uh, somewhere between three and four thousand actually required hospitalization. So this is not, you know, this is not like getting your hair cut. Yes, right. And so, and, it, and so, it, it does happen. The Gosnell case, extreme example, mm-hmm. but this clearly is a situation that I would think you would want. I look, if I were a woman and I was predisposed to have an abortion, I would want to know that if something went wrong, they could get a gurney down the hallway, could get me into a, a, a wagon, and get me to a hospital where the doctor had admitting privileges so that I could be seen. And I'd be troubled if it was more than 30 miles away. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, you know, so, so, uh, so a, again, this is a um, uh, it, it justice. Leader writing, you mentioned ser- uh, what's called severability, a legal term, which means that you can take, you can parse out the parts of a, de- of a law and agree with some of it. It's sort of like a line item veto. You can uh, you can agree with some of it and disagree with other parts. So, uh, Justice Alito says by foregoing s- severability, the court strikes down numerous provisions that could not possibly impose an undue burden. For example, surgical center patients must be treated with respect, consideration, and dignity. That's now enjoined. In other words, it's not required. Um, uh, patients may not be given misleading advertising regarding the competence and or capabilities of the organization. Enjoined. Centers must maintain fi- fire alarm and emergency communication systems and eliminate hazards that might lead to slipping, falling, electrical shock, burns, poisoning, or other trauma. Enjoined and enjoined. You know, Again, these were part of the Texas law that's now been struck down completely. Exactly. So... Go ahead, open up your shop now any way you wish. And do anything you want. So now they've got to come back at this and take out the pieces and see if they can construct some kind of a law that at least puts them under, you know, right. workplace safety yeah, uh, now, now standards. Part of the majority says, well, some of those standards are already in place, you know, but not necessarily. I mean, this was specific to these clinics that may not be specifically mentioned because they are not considered surgical centers. So they may not have to meet those. But again, you know, it it is this safety issue. If you look at Hillary Clinton's tweet, and I don't receive, I don't not, I don't get her Twitter feed, but her her tweet was SCOTUS's decision is a victory for women in Texas and across America. Safe abortion should be a right, not just on paper, but in reality. Well, that is precisely what Texas was trying to accomplish: was a safe abortion. Mm -hmm. So how it, it, it. it is mind-boggling that somebody running for the president of the United States would say it's a victory for safety. Because she knows that her lobby is going to be composed of people who are going to say any restriction, including a late-term abortion for that matter, any restriction of any abortion at any time, uh, viable or not, uh, any any kind of those restrictions ought to be struck down. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so it is. It's not about. Uh, it, it really isn't about the safety. You mentioned before about follow the money. It, yes. it, it is about a, you know you're not going to step on this provision uh, in any way, shape, or form. The Roe v. Wade and the subsequent decisions, they they must not be. Those those are that's the other tablet. Those are written yeah. on a tablet somewhere. I know, just know they are. <laughs> yeah, and you know we have a lot of conversations on the show about the need to elect Christian officials, the need to put Christians in government. And I, listen, I'm all about that. I'd, I'd much rather see a Christian, you know, uh, working on it, working from his own moral compass, which is God's, mm-hmm. than I would some of the stuff that we see right now. But the reality is, you know, for us as Christians, that that is a good thing. But for us as Christians, the 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 next step really when we look when we're confronted with this the next step everybody in this neighborhood here in Moorhead City and around ought to be taking is talking to people especially talking to our daughters talking to our wives talking to our girlfriends about the realities of abortion not only about the realities of abortion but the reality of a god created human life 
you know, we have the strongest tool available to us right now, and it's not the courts. The courts clearly are not our friend right now as Christians. Mm -hmm. But the strong tool we have is the Word of God and the creation of God, the beauty of the creation of God, and it's something we've got to spend more time sharing with our families, especially fathers. You know, this was a huge failing for me as a father that I did. I don't think I spent enough time with my daughters, particularly, explaining how beautiful is the human body, how beautifully made, how sacred, uh, how it is to be honored, how it is, you know, in others. And uh, this is, you know, for anybody that's that's listening to the show today and says, well, I don't know what I can do about this. It's out of my hands. Oh, no, it's not. No. It's right across the dinner table from right. you. It's in the pew in front of you in church. There is somebody there that just needs to have a conversation about the beauty of God's creation and your part in it. And if you don't feel equipped to do that, there are people who are becoming equipped to do that. For example, uh, in, in our local uh, Carter County in the Pregnancy Center here, also yeah. in Pregnancy Centers and other places, too, that are now involving fathers that are now looking to, to in, in improve their programs to reach out to fathers. This is about whole families yes. remaining intact. Yeah, and that, is, it's, and that is beautiful. The idea that you can help a dad to understand what it means to be a dad and how to be a dad means he will be more likely to want to keep a child mm -hmm. and can be a, a positive influence in the life of the girlfriend, the wife, the whatever. And that does have a record of bringing down abortions. It is a, a again as we look at what these court decisions are, they're, they're obviously going to be without respect to to God, without respect to the uh, godly position here. Let's look at another one. This is uh, from uh, the divided Supreme Court on Tuesday turned away an appeal by a family-owned pharmacy that cited Christian beliefs and objecting uh, to, uh, to providing emergency contraceptives to women under a Washington state rule, prompting a searing dissent by conservative Justice Samuel Alito. Alito taking up kind of the voice now of uh, uh, Scalia. Uh, divide, and it is from an article, this is from an article from Reuters, says the justices left in place a 2015 ruling by the San Francisco-based Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that held a state regulation that requires pharmacies to deliver all prescribed drugs, including contraceptives, in a timely manner. Three conservatives among eight justices argued that the court should have agreed to hear the appeal by the Stormins family, which owns the Ralph's Thriftway, Thriftway grocery store and pharmacy in Olympia. Alito, joined by Chief Justice John Roberts and Judge Justice Clarence Thomas, said that the court's decision to not hear is an ominous sign for the future of a religious liberty claims. Mm -hmm. Again, not going to take on a religious liberty claim here. Uh, that the, the, This pharmacy just couldn't say, oh, we don't carry that. I mean, th that would be illegal for them to say, we don't carry that. They don't have to explain themselves. It just just to say that we don't carry that, and and that it, you know somebody can go down the street to the CVS down the street or to the you know to the local pharmacy somewhere else. Well, the again the argument comes down to it, it becomes an issue of whether the good of the whole outweighs the the right of the individual. In other words, if you're if you're this this poor family out there in Washington, you know if you run a store, let me put it this way, you can pick what you want to sell in your store. You can decide right. what you will and will sure. not have. Mm -hmm. And to a degree, a drugstore has that same flexibility. You can decide, well, I don't want to have this and I do want to have that. In every part of the store, except according to the San Francisco ruling, uh, except the pharmacy. Right. In which case, if somebody comes in, you are required to provide what they need and do it in a timely Every prescription to, ever made. To, exactly, <laughs> which, which is just mind-boggling. I used to mm -hmm. work for Revco Drugstores many years ago, long before this stuff ever came up. Mm -hmm. And there were any number of products that we simply refused to carry. Either they were not proven or they had a danger to them or they were just too expensive for the clientele, so we put a, a generic equivalent out. There were just products we did not carry. And this family is simply saying, look, we, it, it, it would be a preference to us to not do the morning after mm -hmm. uh, drug. That's right. what this is about, of right. course. Right. Because their Christian beliefs view that as being a... Mm -hmm. as, as, a, as an abortion as, tool. As, yes, as being against their, their basic core values. More to come on Faith Matters on the talk station.
Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And uh, thanks for being with us here today. And I'm Ben Ball. And uh, Robert could not be with us today, not feeling very well, but uh, we certainly pray that he will recover soon. And meanwhile, uh, Bishop Doc Loomis is with us here today. And Bishop probably <laughs> prays he recovers soon, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Please come back. Uh, but we were talking about two Supreme Court decisions. One was uh, striking down the Texas law that uh, provided for uh, basically um, ambulatory surgical requirements and other things for an abortion clinic, so it was struck down. And then the refusal of the court to hear an appeal or a case uh, out of the San Francisco Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals involving a Washington state pharmacy that refused to sell morning after pills or uh, and the like. So, uh, and uh, they refused to hear that. And in both cases, though, uh, you noted this, uh, that both cases cited a similar reasons for doing so. Yes, the Supreme Court in in both rulings, the, the the first ruling that we talked about a little while ago, and then this d- decision not to hear, cited patient safety as being their 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 overriding uh, decision maker. In the first case, you'll remember it was patient safety uh, was what Texas seemed to be wanting, mm-hmm. and the court was saying actually that isn't as important as um, inter- as the fact that you're interfering in their opinion with a woman's right. In this case. The family simply didn't want to uh, to to take this moral step and and put these things out, but the court ruled that patient safety was the most important. Was thing, the most important. The very thing they had ruled against in Texas. It's ironic to say the least, and I think when we see these kinds of irony in the court, and when we see these kinds of irony in bills that are passed in our own house, uh, in our Congress, then we have to recognize that that th- this is this is money and this is politics and this is arbitrary. One other thing about that is that uh, they also uh, they cited in the first case in striking down the Texas law that it presented an undue burden on the, on the women, and then in the uh, in the uh, pharmacy uh, law, it didn't mention that this that there was any kind of burden. In other words, uh, that no, uh, because there's five other pharmacies right. within a block of this one. This right. is you know how pharmacies are; they're all kind of glopped together. Yeah, this wasn't the only pharmacy in town. You could kind of understand it if it were, mm-hmm. but the idea was because it's the morning after, and because the the ruling was that things had to be done quickly. That the that if somebody walked into a pharmacy and the pharmacist said no we're not going to do that or no we don't have that and they had to get in their car and drive another two or three blocks that it could be too late we have uh we've had we've seen uh, history uh, from the top of uh of the food chain and in, in the government in terms of uh, enforcing the law where attorney general will pick and choose uh, mm-hmm. what they want to consider uh in enforcing the constitution we've seen it at the state level in the same way of uh, picking and choosing what laws to enforce or what um, arguments to 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 um, get behind, and, and you you were mentioning that uh, posting that by Robert we're going to include him in the show uh, yeah. posting by him on his Facebook page this morning that really speaks to this that speaks to decisions that are by that are expedient that are that that rely on the public whim. Well, it's Francis Schaeffer's quote, and I was glad that Robert posted. He posted it this morning. Uh, perhaps inspired by these various articles. But basically, Francis, back in the early 1980s, predicted where we would be today. And the idea was that we were increasingly moving toward a, toward a humanist society. And a humanist society, by its nature, has to push God out of the way so that whatever we think is what we in our finite minds and our finite experiences, there is no overarching word of God. There's no moral code that comes from a supreme being. It's just we become the supreme being would be a a decent definition. And when that happens, man is the top, man is the top. And so when that happens, then every, every decision we make, every law we pass is by its very nature arbitrary because we are faulty, we are arbitrary, we live in specific times, seasons, nations. And without God's word behind it, we are left to our own devices and we make arbitrary decisions. This is exactly what you see in the court rulings right now. A group of people that are not modeled, modeling their decisions after any divine law, but are just saying, well, what's best for society? What's best right now, right. today? Mm-hmm. And that's where the decisions come from. Now, from that, we can actually go and talk about our favorite Christian. 
<laughs> the Pope is in the news again. I was wondering which one you're going to go to. It's either that or Donald <laughs> yeah. Trump. Well, we yes. talked about Robert, so <laughs> might as well be the Pope now. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. Well, in fact, uh, they're uh, certainly uh, making uh, headlines in this past week or so. It's been a, an interview, and this is a, the papal interview on the plane. It seems to be where we're getting a lot of the headlines. This is him doubling down on a similar interview. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, where it says the headline from the National Catholic Reporter is, uh, from Pope Francis is Christians must apologize to gay people for marginalizing them. The Catholic Church and other Christian communities must apologize to gay people in many groups that they have let down or offended throughout history, Pope Francis has said. Once again, I say the headline writer controls the power here because he was talking about marginalized group that also included gay people and others, but he wasn't exclusively referring to them, correct? Am that I is correct. That? Yeah. So in a press conference Sunday on the flight back to Rome after its weekend trip to Armenia, the pontiff said bluntly, the church must say it's sorry for not having comported itself well many, many times. Uh, many times. Uh, I believe that the church must uh, not uh, only must say it's sorry to this person that is gay, that is offended, said the pope, but it must say sorry to the poor, also to the mistreated women, to children forced to work. Uh, and when I say the church, Christians, Francis clarified, the church is holy. We are the sinners. That, that's a little different impression than if you just saw the clickbait headline. That's exactly right. He, he was He's very, very clearly talking about marginalized people. He did this trip to Armenia where he talked about the, uh, the genocide there. Mm -hmm. He's talked about the poor any number of times. Anyone who is marginalized, you know, let me just say this. If the church itself marginalizes somebody mm -hmm. instead of, uh, what's the word the Pope uses? Uh, accompanying them. Mm -hmm. he, he calls for an accompaniment. Right. Right. That is a pastoral accompaniment. Along. We should walk alongside these people and not hate them because mm -hmm. we're all sinners. That's, right. his, that's his argument, and I love it. He's absolutely right. But the idea that you know, what I want to hear the Pope talk about more is not just, you know, we seem to, as a, as a world, we're all on an apology tour now. <laughs> we are, we've got a president that goes around the world, apologizes. We've got a Pope that goes around the world and apologizes. Maybe it's time. Maybe that's just, you know, the, the zeitgeist right now. But I want to hear the Pope talk a little bit more, a, a little less about what the catechism, here's his quote. He says, uh, uh, I will also repeat what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. That and now and then this is it, uh, this is set in here in parentheses that gay people should not be discriminated against. That they have to be respected, pastorally accompanied. I completely agree with that. But I, I want to hear a little bit more about not what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, but, but what, what, the, what the Word of God has to say about this. Mm -hmm. And this Pope has not been really wonderful in, in sharing some of the harder words of God, I don't think. Well, you know, I had a conversation this week with a guy, um, um, I forget his name right now, but he, he wrote a book called Critical Conversations, and we had him on earlier, but we were talking about Christian's response to Orlando. And I said, you know, uh, here's here's where we need to have some parallel, this talking about walking along, that we can we should, as Christians, be talking with the LGBT community about how we're on the same side on this and that we both need to be uh, recognizing evil mm -hmm evil as the source here of this we can have our debate and we should have our discussion and our debate but it's not a matter of not loving each other it's a matter of that this is evil that hates you that hates me yeah that's a good point and 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 the other side of that coin is that we that what the lord looks at in us is he looks at the condition of our heart not the sin we commit you know when we apologize to somebody we apologize for marginalizing them but what i really want to do is i want to apologize first to them and then to the lord for carrying that hatred in my heart for them right for marginalizing them in my life as a being of yes because that's creation. what the lord's looking at he's yeah. saying what's the disposition of doc's heart as it relates to to gay people or poor people or black people or white people what is the disposition of heart he He's, he is much, and, and again, the Pope, 
doesn't speak quite so much. I would love to hear more about the condition of the heart because it's the heart that enters into the kingdom. It's the kingdom that's well, made for hearts. It's what God sees. And this is where we hope then during his time uh, he will uh, that the writings will be what we can. But instead, the press though is going to go on what is uh, what is um, uh, press conferences when he walks back from first class into the press class back in the in the papal plane. Yeah. You know that's where this comes from. That's where a lot of headlines come from. And we know we almost always say to people who are who are in positions of power, uh, be careful about those impromptu com- conversations and yeah. and uh, and press conferences. But again, the the, the thing we mm-hmm. as Christians but we have want to, this from that's you. exactly right. Yeah. And we have to look at the the condition of our heart and mm-hmm. and where we are. You know, if there's any repentance to be done, it, it's tr- it's truly when we look at our heart and ask ourselves hard questions like, how do I really feel about race? How do I really feel about sexuality? How do I really feel about uh, wealth? And 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 if if in the heart, I mean, I work with addicts a lot, and I love I when I look at an addict, I don't see a, a person to hate. I don't see a person that is 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 lost to society or that is somehow a burden. I see an opportunity for God to do a miracle. And I see an opportunity for God to do a miracle in a gay man, mm-hmm. in an addicted man, in a poor man, in a, any kind of man. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the way I want to walk through my life. I think we want to look at our hearts and say, do we actually see God having an opportunity in a life, and how can I be a part of that? Well, to, to, to tie in a little bit of the uh, last two segments here, is that, uh, is that um, you know, in, in days gone by, uh, a leader in this country would call on the nation for prayer and fasting. Yes. Yes. Uh, that, that we should look, no matter if we were, even if we were greatly harmed after a great disaster, we should look and see where do we need to repent? Where do we also need to be prayer and fasting? And then let's together tackle this issue. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, I think is sorely missing in our society. Again, on the apology tour. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And we'll have our concluding segment in just a moment. And welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And this is our final segment together. Uh, and I, I'm Ben Ball along with Bishop Doc Loomis. And, and uh, Doc, uh, uh, we want to talk about the one last thing uh, today. Uh, well, maybe two, but we'll, we'll talk about one anyway. And that's uh, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, when you said you wanted to talk about your favorite Christian, I said, which one? Is it the Pope or Donald Trump? <laughs> Uh, because this is the story that is out uh, from uh, Liberty, Unit, well, actually from James Dobson, saying that Trump recently accepted a relationship with Christ. And this is written in Politico. Uh, Donald Trump, born again Christian? It's a question mark. The presumptive Republican nominee uh, captured a significant number of evangelical voters during the GOP primary. And that may be due to recently accepting a relationship with Christ, according to evangelical leader James Dobson. I, I kind of disagree with the premise right there. From the totally premise. disagree with the premise. Yeah, yes, right there from the from the get go. Uh, but uh, Trump did meet just recently with hundreds of evangelical leaders in New York earlier this week. And while some well known figures, such as Liberty University's President James, Jerry Falwell Jr., have endorsed the candidate, others are more hesitant to do so. However, James Dobson, the Christian psychologist and founder of the Focus on the Family Group, says he knows the person who led Trump to Christ. And that's fairly recent, calling him still a baby Christian. Uh, is this a is this a newsworthy article? Is this uh, I'm sure, I'm not surprised Politico jumping on it, but it, I don't think it's um, it, it has never been in my mindset that this was why this is why he garnered so many voters votes from evangelicals. Well, it better be a newsworthy article, or we're going to have like ten minutes of dead air going <laughs> forward here. I think it's I think it's a fascinating article. First of all, I think it's fascinating that Dobson decided to mention this. It was not Dr. Dobson who led him to Christ, but he said he knows the guy that did. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm interested in is is really not whether he has or has not said a sinner's prayer. I mean, I, I my heart goes out to him. I hope he has. Yeah, you know, all certainly. heaven rejoices and we rejoice right along with it. If that's in fact the case. 
which only goes to show well, he was Presbyterian before, right? Right. See, so apparently <laughs> Presbyterians, you can be now, a Presbyterian. Now, no, I'm now, not going to be careful. Okay. So it's a, um, uh, it's newsworthy if he changes his manner of life. It's newsworthy if he selects to follow Christ and his teachings. If he grows as a Christian. Exactly. That will be newsworthy to yeah. me. If Donald Trump walked out one day and said, you know, I, I used to think this, but I don't think this anymore, and it's largely because of the relationship that's mm-hmm. growing in me with Jesus Christ, that would be a huge news story. Whether or not somebody here, I'll give but you an example. But that would be similar to what uh, George W. Bush ha- said in his campaign. It would be similar to that. It would be similar to what John Kasich said. I mean, the, mm-hmm. what John, you know, a, a friend of mine, uh, Stu Bamig, actually led John Kasich, former presidential candidate, governor mm-hmm. of the great state of Ohio, to the Lord in a in a morning Bible study at the state house. And the thing about that is, John didn't overnight become the John Kasich that we saw. But he did over time grow, and you can see in the decisions he made that his moral compass began to shift about mm-hmm. 180 degrees from the John Kasich before and the John Kasich today. I would love nothing more than to start to see that, that, that perceptible movement of mm-hmm. uh, Donald Trump's compass because he has so many other – he actually does have a number of remarkable gifts – that if he had the compassion of Christ behind him, if he had the wisdom of Christ behind him, if he had the love, the generosity of Christ behind him, he actually would be a pretty remarkable leader if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and as you you bring up uh, John Kasich and, and others there too, again, this will be um, – uh, we were having this discussion actually in a Bible class talking about wearing the cross, uh, and it said, uh, "Is this? And you know, how do we know? I mean, the, what, what's uh, if they don't wear the cross? How we know? I said, well, you know them by their love. So uh, if if yes. if we see this demonstrated by him, it'll be more than any kind of pin he can wear or any sort of uh, uh, outward demonstration will be the will be the the actual fruits of the spirit." Yeah, and so the question is, you know, what's the motivation for Hirsch's article? What's the motivation for Dobson's mm-hmm. uh, pronouncement? There's no real detail involved. I, gosh, it's I, a know, I it's a headline. Well, it, I mean, it is. It basically, it's a headline in four paragraphs yeah. that we're trying to make into a twelve-minute segment. But, <laughs> you know, what what was the point? Well, why did Doctor Dobson decide that he needed to release this information? Oh, I think it's a. Uh, it may, basically is a. Um, I don't want to say it's opportunistic necessarily, but I think it's just basically a response, offhand remark. I don't know that it has any uh, other great – I'm not going to put any great purpose to it other than saying I think maybe he's on the right path. Maybe maybe this is a – you know, I, I, was, I was probably going to vote for him anyway, but now maybe he's on this path that I can really get behind. Yeah, and – Listen, I like I like Dr. Dobson. I like his radio programming. I mm-hmm. like his materials. A lot of good stuff there uh, around the family. What I'm concerned about is this really paints Donald Trump in a new light. Before, we had a question. He's a Presbyterian. Mm-hmm. He's a Christian. He's not. We're not sure. But if I looked at his <laughs> life, I would say Could he's name probably a not living Bible a, verse, a yeah. great Christian, yeah. probably not living a great Christian life right now. Mm-hmm. Um then, but now, if you say, but now he's just received Christ and he's a baby Christian, then there's a built-in excuse. <laughs> well, of course he's not living. He's, he's a baby he Christian. He's a brand new yet. Christian. Yeah. He's just beginning to learn. And it concerns me that it feels politically motivated to to paint Donald as a baby Christian so that the attacks won't be so severe on him. Or so there'll be a response to the attacks. Well, you know, he's only... A baby Christian. Well, yeah, you know, but you bring up a point, though, is that uh, do we want our, our politicians, do we want uh, our leaders to, to be all-knowing and all-seeing? I mean, do they have to be, do they have to be at, at an expert level uh, uh, for in any of their gifts uh, for us to believe them uh, that, they are, uh, that they have benefit or that they, they should be entrusted? You know, uh, so what? So what you're saying is that you, you, this might may give him excuse for not being there yet. But did we care before? I mean, were we that concerned before? I, I don't know if we cared. I just know that every once in a while, a politician shows up on the scene who really is, well, not all knowing, but 
you know, is really a remarkable politician. And that politician usually gets us through one of the most desperate times, or maybe desperate times bring these people to the top, you know. Mm-hmm. But if you think about the, the, the Lincolns and, and, and um, to a degree, Washington himself, um, you see very raucous, hard times when a very insightful, almost all-seeing leader seems to emerge. Mm-hmm. I wonder if, if that's a pattern that does repeat itself in this country, then I wonder if, uh, that if we may not be seeing the emergence of one of these leaders and if his newfound relationship with Christ isn't a part of it, because gosh knows, mm-hmm. for the two I mentioned earlier, it was a real big deal. Yeah, well, that will be interesting to see. <laughs> I, I brought. I want. I want to hold this up. This is. Uh, this is a, a ministry that you're involved in uh, called uh, uh, One Night Out. I just wanted to let you have a couple of minutes and we talk about this a little bit. So. Oh, we great! Can, we yeah, it was so nice of you to have uh, our buddy Gene McClendon from Hope Mission in here with me a week or two ago, doing a, a little promo. Uh, by the time this show airs, uh, we will have launched our. Mm-hmm. Uh, our worship service we're starting at hope mission on thursday evenings at six it is a big sit down dinner for everybody it doesn't have any cost whatsoever every thursday every single thursday mm-hmm. and uh then after the dinner we got some amazing musicians going to get up and play and sing we're going to have uh gosh i I the I know the fellow who's preaching. He's one of the best preachers I've ever heard, mm-hmm. and uh, he's going to be preaching that night. And uh, we'll get we'll get folks out of there within a reasonable period of time. But it's just an opportunity to come and worship, and it is a ministry that is for people who probably don't go to church at all. Mm-hmm. But it's, even if you do, it's not meant oh, to replace. No, and that's why we church. do it on Thursday night. If you right. want to come, come. But the point of it is to have an opportunity to really focus in on how God heals brokenness in mm-hmm. our life. Right. It's a topic that comes up in church from time to time, but we do it every week. So we talk about addictions. We talk about broken marriages. We talk about financial problems. We talk about a lot of the issues like sexuality that we talked about on the show today. Mm-hmm. And the idea is to have a group of people to come who, have been, uh, who are walking down that road to recovery and have them to interface and partner and disciple with people who might be just a little bit further down that road mm-hmm. to build relationships where we can walk with each other and help one another down the road to wellness, recovery, uh, marital stability, or whatever it is that is is our particular brokenness. And trust me, Ben, you and I both know this. We pastor churches. Uh, we all are broken. No, we all have that. That and those, this is if, you, if you're broken, <laughs> yes. or if you've been broken, and you can help somebody else that is broken. This is a place for you to come. So it's Thursday every Thursday night what at time? six o'clock. At Hope Mission, supper starts, and as Bridges soon as Street, as soon Bridges as the dessert Street, comes out, uh, 14th and Bridges, absolutely. Yeah. Parking in the lot next door. Uh, ride your bike, ride your moped, walk over, whatever you can do to get there. It is a blast. Lot next door, not the fire station next door. Not the fire station <laughs> next door. That's <laughs> leave, leave that clear. <laughs> yes. uh, but and come to the thrift store while you're there too. Yeah. Great thrift store opened up across the street. Mm-hmm. You know they we did about thirty eight thousand meals out of Hope Mission last year, and I have no. I, you know we do this fifty two weeks a year. We're expecting tonight is our opening night, meaning. Thursday, last Thursday, when we record this, yeah. yeah, when we recorded this, we're expecting over a hundred people to show up for the first night. Okay, uh, and again, God bless you on this uh, ministry. I think it's it's wonderful. Again, food, we, fellowship, and fun. We and 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 uh, and healing. Absolutely, and that's the idea. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and uh, that's going to wrap it up for us for Faith Matters for this week here on the Talk Station FM one hundred and seven and AM twelve forty. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. of the talk station.